Good morning, everyone. We're very pleased to be here within the WWF Pavilion uh, in order to provide some perspectives from our youth in particular uh, concerning climate change and its impacts and uh, our reactions, responses to it, and especially emphasizing resilience. For those that don't know, the Inuit Circumpolar Council is an international non-governmental organization, an indigenous peoples organization that was established in June of 1977 in Utqiagat, Alaska. We represent approximately 180,000 Inuit throughout Chukotka in the Russian Far East, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland. We have offices in Anadir, Anchorage, Alaska, Ottawa, Canada, and in Nuuk, Greenland. We have a wide array of portfolios that we monitor at the international level by virtue of our non-governmental organization status within the UN. We're also very active in regional intergovernmental organizations such as the Arctic Council, as well as any other political or legal fora of concern to us. Uh, essentially, we are the united voice for Inuit at the international level. So we're very pleased to participate today and to offer uh, some perspectives, not only on the impacts of climate change, but uh, specifically um, influencing, hopefully, the outcomes of this particular COP26. Before we begin with the uh, more informal dialogue, we are going to screen uh, the comments of one of our uh, colleagues and uh, brothers who is en route. He lands, I think, at 3.45 p.m. today. So uh, because he wasn't able to join us uh, here and now, we'd like um, to screen the film uh, that allows for Jimmy Olick to give his uh, commentary on climate change and what he has seen. So if we can run that, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Jimmy Likatalik. I'm the manager for the Spence Bay Hunters and Trappers Association in Tulgorok. I've been hired as a manager since 2015, and uh, as soon as I started, the board wanted me to look up on, look up on how to protect Arvekto, Boothia Peninsula. 2016, I submit to the uh, Planning Commission and the uh, Inuit, Inuit Association, Regional Inuit Association, uh, a map of uh, Boothia Peninsula and outline the whole the whole Boothia, saying that the board wants the uh, land to be protected from uh, exploration, mining, and uh, gas exploration. In 1972, they, the Polar Self Continental Project was trying to uh, put a pipeline through. Uh, Boothia Peninsula, but the elders way back then didn't want any any exploration or any the gas line the gas pipeline to be down to Arvekto. They said no to this uh, project, and ever since the board wanted that to be carried forward, and therefore I'm uh, very thankful for all the help we've been getting. Uh, to protect Boothia Peninsula, Arvektog. Arvektog is um, a, a land that has uh, two sides of ocean that people go hunting on both sides of the ocean. Um, so it's it's not it's a land that it's not very big. But on, on paper, it looks big. But to the uh, elders, seeing that it's very narrow, so they, and it's a very it's a calving ground, um, caribou calving ground, muskox calving ground. Uh, 
uh, and all the other um, McIntyre Bird School have offspring there in um, Alberto. So from from there we I uh, put in a proposal to protect protect uh, Alberto from mining and exploration. The the caribou migration, it's a caribou annual migration route from south to north of uh, Boothia. Um, we also want to protect the area, the marine area. Uh, we outlined the marine area. Um, it, all of it is our e ecosystem. We, we feel all of it is um, as one. If we feel that if one part of it being uh, industrial um, happening or if there's a spell, the whole system is going to be um, destroyed. So therefore, the the, the board wanted uh, the marine also marine area to be protected as well. Uh, 2018, 2019, there was a, a hunter and his family uh, witnessed uh, a bowhead whale calving, and that that made me even want to protect Agavesto uh, even more. So uh, again, um, there's there's so much um, wildlife there that you know. I've seen as a child, um, and therefore I want my children and great grandchildren to see what I've seen, and that's what um, the the members of the community wants. So therefore, we're we're very thankful for all the help we're getting from WWF and our academic partners to protect and um, get just. Uh, terrestrial and marine guardians to start working with us uh, to protect Alberto. Like I said, it's a, it's, it's a migratory bird that go there. Uh, 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 all the muskox and caribou, wolves, any animals give offspring there. So it's very important to us. Um, This, we have many. We have many. We have nine major rivers that have uh, char, Arctic char running into them, and therefore this is very, very important to us. The, there was also um, a report a few years back on Canada's having most uh, clean polar bear, and we want to keep it that way. We also know that um, the, the oxygen is renewed in the north, so we want to keep it clean as possible to keep having our oxygen renewed. There's so many um, uh, so many things that uh, why we want to protect uh, Alberto. But those are uh, some of the things we we are doing for to protect Alberto. Uh, we're also working on uh, trying to get a cut and wrap facility. It's called Nrekakut, means our food. Since we we are not trying to get uh, mining and exploration going on, but we need to create jobs. Uh, we're working on doing right now. Um, Water sampling, fish sampling, uh, also wildlife sampling, uh, caribou, muskox, even uh, whale sampling, seal sampling. All this is going to help us uh, to make sure we have a management plan and not over harvest any any um, wildlife. This this will create some jobs for our community. Uh, also, with uh, without 
proper access to uh, country food since um, a lot of people are on income support. Ha they have no means in going uh, out on the land uh, to, to get their country meat. So therefore a lot of diabetes is happening in, in the north. Uh, this is to get access to affordable access to country food to create jobs. Um, with the climate change, we it seem like every 10 years is uh, as a drastic change, and therefore, with with uh, with our management plan, working with the elders, uh, we'll have we'll teach the younger children, younger younger people how how to hunt properly. Also, with the climate change, uh, a lot of uh, roots are. Uh, somewhat dangerous uh, for today without the knowledge of the land, proper proper knowledge of the land. We'll, we'll get the elders to teach the younger children so that um, it will be passed down from generation to generation like it has been for, for many years. The climate change is, is very uh, drastic for us. For the last five years we noticed um, usually by September, end of September, there's, uh, people are skating on the ponds, but this year um, it's been raining, uh, mist and uh, fog, it's the end of October, and that's never, we've never seen that before. Um, therefore, the North Passage will also are going to look at the North Passage and North Passage is right on Booth, uh, or top of Boothia, Arbicto. Uh, Therefore we are afraid of uh, a lot of ships starting to go through there with a lot of them having fossil fuel. We are not equipped with um, if, if there's an oil spill so we want, we want to take care of that so that N n n there's limited limited traffic on um, the Northwest Passage. Um, th those are some of, those are some of the things we're looking at uh, to protect Arbicto, uh, to protect the wildlife, the marine wildlife um, for for generations to see. In the meat. For um, our our culture, we've been uh, living in uh, ice and snow, and that's what we know uh, best when we're when we're out on the land. Right now, with the climate change, they're so it's so different. We used to live in igloos. All the time, or when I was a, when I was younger, we we stayed in igloos. That because it was so so much colder. Um, today we we seem to be being able to put uh, canvas tents and sleep in canvas tents more out on the land, versus when I was younger, uh, we had to build igloos to stay warm. Uh, today is very different. Uh, like I said, we could easily uh, just set up uh, canvas tents. Actually, this uh, story, um, when uh, before before modern day events, there was um, a mother and a child. A child was uh, playing on the ground, digging on the ground. Um, and her her mom told her, "Quit digging! Don't dig so very deep, because you're gonna give off gas, and it's gonna get warmer." Imagine, imagine uh, mines and stuff like that, uh, digging up ground, that much ground, and giving off some gas. So, therefore, we feel the um, ozone 
layers also affected by that, by mining and uh, exploration, stuff like that. But it's very different. Um, we, we are used to more being out on, um, out and about in, on uh, snow and snow and ice uh, versus um, the sum, sum, summertime we had more limited access to going to uh, our camp, camping ground or staying versus uh, snow and ice and, and therefore this it, it has an effect uh, on uh, today's life because the summers and seem to be longer and like for example um, I, I've been trying to go uh, out of Tullow Rock for four days it, it was misty and snow uh, sn foggy for four days straight pretty much and we'd never seen that before um, therefore there's climate change the one of my one of the hunters back home uh, he said he'd never um, there was it was raining while he was check, checking his nets and he said it was just like springtime because he, the wa there was water on top of the ice while he was doing his nets and that was October so there's so much difference today in the meat. If I could say one thing to the world, and, and the, I would I would want to say I I like to say that without the land and water, we are nothing. So I like we would like to help by protecting the land and help conserve the world by protecting the land. Couldn't me. his delay in arrival here at, at COP26. Um, so now for the, for the live event, I, I'm still bubbling over about yesterday's side event uh, in the Green Zone um, because uh, these three youth, moderated also by another young Inuk, uh, Crystal Martin Lohensky, did a brilliant uh, job in addressing numerous questions and I called home and told my uh, husband and daughter that that's it I can leave the cop we are in good hands and uh, in terms of future leadership it's it, it really is um, extraordinary so I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful and uh, have full confidence in uh, the intellect of uh, the three in the before me. Uh, so, Addy Masa is from Sitnaswa, Alaska, a community development specialist at Kawarik, uh, the tribal organization for the Bering Straits region, and I'm sure she'll describe the Bering Straits a bit further. We're joined also by Brian Fottle, who is presently the president of the National Inuit Youth Council in Canada. Uh, he is trained as an electrical engineer and um, has many unique perspectives uh, uh, as an Inuk, but also based on that particular training. And uh, in the middle, Victoria Bushman is a wildlife biologist and presently working as a conservation research fellow, as well as an indigenous knowledge and conservation uh, advisor and, and a consultant recently uh, minted PhD, uh, and maybe she'll address some of the, those challenges as, as an Inuk within the academy. The first thing I'd like to do is invite each of them to speak for about five minutes about where they're from and how they were socialized and uh, their perspectives of, um, of Inuit in this world and in 
particular in relation to to climate change and just to free wheel it for uh, for a few minutes about about yourselves and we'll start with Abby. Koyana Daily and Koyana Kalrepsi, everybody, thank you for coming. Oonga Atira Aklasia, Ksinisara Miuro Runga. My Inupiak name, my Atik, is Aklasia, and I come from Sidnesok. Um, but my roots in Alaska, they come from um, the most western point on the mainland from Wales or Kingerin. So uh, that's where my Inupiak side comes from. And my mother, she comes from the lower Yukon, the largest river um, in North America where, the, um, where we currently have the biggest uh, salmon run. Um, she comes from the mouth of that river in Mountain Village or Asachalaya. So I'm also Yupik as well. Um, and I <coughs> had mentioned that my uh, my atik, my Inupiaq name means Aklasia, and it translates to Little Bear. And um, that name is a very ancient name. It's come from many, many people before me. Um, and I wanted to recognize that by bringing my ancestors into this space with me. Um, and with that, I'll also mention I have um, one son. I currently, or I recently became a mom. He's one years old. Um, this is my first travel away from him. So. Um, it's been quite hard, but I'm really grateful that um, I was able to come here. Um, he was given his, um, his real names by both of his great-grandparents who are still alive, um, both of my grandparents, both from my Yupik side and my Inupiaq side. Um, and same with, me, same with my names, his names are very, very old, and they come from generations before him. Uqilanik um, Ayoluk are his two names, um, they're both from my fourth to the great grandparents, uh, my grandfathers. So um, that just, I wanted to speak to that to mention how, how long and how deep our roots run um, in, in my homelands of the, of the Koyuk region. Um, and I'll also mention too, um, I haven't really, uh, most of, much of our traditions and our history of who we are prior to colonization has been lost. But there, there is one. Um, there was one book that was um, kept as for record for people like me to k remember those stories. And this was prior to becoming a book. It was an oral tradition. It was history that was kept through story by passing on to the new children coming in every, um, every each generation. Um, and this story it talks about um, three great disasters. And as, as you uh, may know in the history of, uh, of the earth, there's been um, many common ones, such as a flood, um, a great shake, or a great earthquake. Um, and, our, and our oral traditions from, from my people, from my families, we kept those stories alive through oral tradition. And that also speaks to how long we have been planted, how deep our roots are um, from, we can't even fathom how, how long ago that was, that it was kept through um, our stories, um, and that just speaks to the power of um, where, where I'm coming from. Um, and Daly had mentioned I'm um, a community development specialist. That is just one role that I hold. I have many, many roles. <laughs> I can't even, um, I, yeah, I can't really fit into one, one role or one box because in, in a small community, you're, you're asked to, 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 to step up. And there's many um, spaces and hats that I have to have to hold. Um, some of those other ones include um, birth work. I'm an indigenous doula and a breastfeeding or a body feeding counselor. Um, I recently was a um, facilitator for an Inuit Health Summit on our connection to wellness and suicide prevention. Um, prior to um, my first job out of college um, after getting uh, my degree was a research assistant in climate force displacement. Um, so helping our communities literally relocate their entire communities and how um, daunting and challenging that process is, um, but it's a very real um, effect that we have to um, begin thinking about, um, prepare for, and be very intentional um, while we're also trying to heal from the effects of colonization um, and capitalism. So that's a little bit about who I am. I'm the eldest of um, six siblings. My parents are Austin Amasuk and Marisha Skene, and my grandparents are Harold and Janet Amasuk, and uh, Marie and Donald Looper. Um, and what else is there to say about me? Oh yeah, I grew up um, pretty um, privileged in the sense that I had access to um, boats and um, 
for from where, I, where I'm from, Nome, it's a very remote um, hub community. So we spend a lot of time on the land. Um, every spring, we're out on the water every single day um, for weeks straight. Um, we're hunting for seal, we're hunting for walrus. Um, in the summer's time, we're, we're fishing, we're picking berries, we're putting away greens. Um, and I really want to emphasize that that is our sustenance, that is what keeps us alive, that is what allowed us to survive and thrive in these very arctic, remote, cold places of the world where many people could not survive. Um, the, the greens that we harvested, they have um, all the fiber that we need. You know, like as humans, we need um, a very nutritious diet and we cannot just survive on one aspect. We, we cannot just survive on, um, like we, I'm saying we need a very um, like diverse diet. Um, and the greens that um, are very little, very low to the ground, we had knowledge that knew exactly what those, um, those plants and how they would nourish us. And the science is just catching up, so uh, we needed high amounts. Our bodies cannot naturally produce vitamin D, and that's where we, a lot of our nutrients come from, our plants, from our animals. And we, we knew that. We knew how to ferment the greens so that they could um, boost their nutritious property. Um, so I was, I was very much raised, I was able to put away fish all year round, or fish in the summertime. Uh, much, all of the meat that we eat, we catch. Um, because as you know, it's, um, or as you may know, it's very expensive to buy meat if you have to. Um, and it's not sustainable, it's, it's flown in from thousands of miles away. Um, so all of the meat that my family eats today is everything that we catch, that we put away. Many of the greens that we harvest um, are keep us going. It's our, it's our soul food that keeps us alive, and many of them are threatened. Um, so that's why, why I'm here, is to um, keep prote protect those for my son and his future generations. The young are dead. And in particular, thank you, Ash. <laughs> in, in, in particular, uh, underscoring the numerous responsibilities that you have. She did mention also that she's uh, a language advocate and uh, learning language as well. So, Victoria. Please. Uh, welcome and thank you for being here with us today. Um, my name is Victoria Kutok Bushman. Uh, my attic is my great grandmother Kutok, and I could tell lots of stories, but I don't think we have time. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm originally from Okayakvik, which is a town the mo at the northernmost tip of Alaska. And this, this community is the largest bowhead whaling community in the world. And we still hunt bowhead by skin boats, where we put a lot of people in the boat, um, and you have to paddle, um, and still hunt uh, in, in many of the traditional old ways. So ever since I was a child, a lot of my life has been impacted by policies that are made at the international level. Even in its very basic form, what my family can put on the table every day is impacted by the policies that we, we put in place. Um, so this is to say that it has been a very long journey for me to become a doctor of conservation biology because it has been such a necessity from a young age. There's such a cognizance for how, um, how we are impacted every day by these outside forces. And a big part of me wanted to learn, well, how is it approached in, how is conservation approached in sort of a Western perspective? Like, how do we think about it? How has it been practiced for the last 100 years? And why is it that so many of our communities feel very challenged by conservation and by the practices that are put in place and the management strategies that are employed? So I came into sort of this education wanting to understand how we can do it better for our communities in ways that are culturally relevant, um, they're ethically based, and that they're fully knowledge based. So not just based on scientific knowledge, because as we know, the Arctic in many regions is still very data deficient. Like we're learning things about basic biology every year. Um, it also requires us knowing, you know, uh, being inclusive of indigenous knowledge and including that as part of the development of our management strategies. And of course, being open to things that we haven't thought about yet, ways of managing, ways of um, approaching these issues 
that are not a part of our conservation toolbox from the Western perspective. Um, so this has been a, a long journey for me. Um, I've worked in Arctic research now for 12 years. I got uh, my start quite young, uh, working on an archaeology project uh, in northern Alaska in a place called Nuvuk, uh, which is a place that is heavily impacted by climate change, a lot of coastal erosion there, but it has also been seasonally occupied for the last 4,000 years. So it is a very important and significant place. And that is where I started to become trained to do like faunal wildlife, like faunal identification for different archaeological projects. Um, and it has since moved on from there. I decided that dead animals were not so interesting as live animals and uh, decided to move to the south uh, to, to pursue my education. Of course, in the north, we don't have all the same opportunities. Um, even depending on your country, you might not have, like for example, Greenland, there is no way to get secondary education in any STEM uh, discipline. So I had to move to the south. And as a part of my journey, I... Um, picked up two masters and uh, decided to do my PhD in conservation biology. So this is just a long way of saying that, you know, these are issues that we are very aware of, climate change, conservation. Jimmy really talked a lot. I think he, he really showcased what is at stake for our people, um, you know, in the conservation of lands and waters and species and, and why it is so relevant. And you spoke to the deep roots and why, like, we really need to be a part of these discussions. Um, so I am just really grateful to be here and to share a little bit about uh, my experience and, and hear from yours. So, Koinakpak, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. Um, Brian. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Brian Pottle, and uh, as Daly mentioned, I'm president of the National Youth Council of Canada. Uh, that's a, a volunteer role. I'm also a uh, director of a, a nonprofit based out of Nunavut, uh, the northern, one of the northern territories in Canada, called the Katinganik Makerspace Network, which act is actually endeavoring to bring uh, makerspaces to the rem super remote communities across Nunavut, there's 25 total, um, as a way of teaching youth who otherwise wouldn't have opportunities to learn technological skills such as robotics, uh, uh, principles of engineering, um, uh, programming, computer programming, game development, those kinds of things as a way to, to bolster um, self-confidence, self-esteem and help increase the competency, competencies in, in ways that uh, otherwise wouldn't exist within the communities. Um, which is very important and a huge part of the work that I, I've actually been doing um, in, in adulthood. So I'm, I'm from um, so Nunatsiavut, Labrador, uh, Canada, uh, easterly uh, portion of, uh, of Canada, where I grew up in two communities actually, Postville and Rigolet. Um, uh, they are very, very small, uh, roughly 200 and 300 uh, population respectively. Um, and uh, it's really interesting actually uh, comparing my upbringing compared to my c uh, contemporaries in the engineering field. Uh, most of them come from long lines of engineers, uh, like their dad, their grandpa, great grandpa were all engineers, uh, whereas I'm the first in my immediate family to, to go to university um, and, and first to seek that education. I, I didn't really have a choice per se. My, my parents, uh, who um, I, I think they're both high school dropouts uh, and later did uh, adult basic education, um, they really heavily impressed upon me the uh, choice, I'll call it, of, of going to post-secondary education. Um, so I, uh, I, when I, when it came time to think about what to study in post-secondary education, uh, I had no idea. I, I mean, I was just, I had no idea what was out there. I, I didn't even know what existed in the world. I didn't even know what an engineer was. Um, and my dad said, oh, I have a buddy who is an engineer and he travels the world doing some kind of security system for airports. I was like, that sounds cool. So let's just do engineering. So, so without even really any thought, really any research, I found myself studying engineering and in fact, I sweat through my whole first year university without even knowing what an engineer was. It was only when I had a, a work term uh, working with uh, the, the provincial government of Newfoundland Labrador 
that I realized, oh, I mean, an engineer is basically synonymous in a way with like a problem solver, somebody who just uh, has to use technical knowledge, technical background to solve problems. Um, and once I understood that, uh, my life in engineering became a lot easier, a lot more clear. Uh, but growing up in Labrador was, uh, yeah, really quite, uh, quite a privilege in many ways because I lived a life that, um, as, a, as a child, was very unencumbered with uh, a lot of the fear that goes along with living in a more urban center, you know, um, being, for example, kidnapped. Um, and, and, and things like that, like you, 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 there was no real malicious intent like that in a small community. Uh, the only thing you really had to be worried about when you're, say, for example, perusing the forest and, 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 and going bouldering was bears and, and wolves and, and whatnot, uh, which uh, is a very, very real threat for sure. Uh, in those parts, but uh, by the way, it's it's funny because um, I, I I myself have kids, and and interestingly enough, like now the things I did as a kid, I don't think I would ever let my kids do because like that's a really close calls. Uh, this like the silly shenanigans we were getting into, uh, it's pretty pretty wild. Um, but uh, so so uh, I had the really eye opening experience when I was uh, in early teens of leaving Labrador, again, populations 200, 300, where I grew up, to, to travel to Saskatchewan, which is more central, um, central Canada, and live in uh, a, a, a town that had 15,000 people. The school I attended had like 500 kids, so like over double the population. Um, so at a, a very young age, I was able to have a, a very eye-opening, worldview-expanding experience um, which I, I think helped to um, center the, well, my life from that point onward. After living in Saskatchewan a short while, I returned to Labrador and, uh, and found that um, I, I just became much more aware of, of what exists in the world uh, and the different cultures, different perspectives. Um, and, uh, and living in a small community, of course, you, you don't get to see much of that. You just mostly see what everybody else is, sees and lives and and you don't really get much injection uh, of other cultures other perspectives because they're so remote so hard to get into and consequently get out of those communities um, and uh, and one of the big things that um, is really pivotal uh, of course um, is uh, for for people living in uh, like remote Inuit communities is being able to uh, you know explore and be on the land and uh, I'm really thankful that uh, have had a lot of that, uh, sometimes a bit too scarily much, though, so, uh, as a kid. Great, thank you. I'm going to yield on any of my commentary just because of because of time. Um, the the next question is, who do you believe is most affected by climate change in your community, and why? Is it Addie? Yeah, <clears throat> um, when I was thinking about my response, I um, I wanted to mention my namesake, which is Aklasiak, and it translates to little bear. Um, and throughout my entire life, I've never really gotten um, an understanding of what that name means and how it relates to our animal relatives. Um, and I say that because I think that that's who I'm most concerned about, who is impacted. Um, and I, I was talking to my dad about, um, like I was gonna, I was drafting a letter to the editor for the newspaper about port development in my community, um, because where I'm from, we're from a very narrow strait that leads to a very um, fast Arctic Ocean, the Bering Strait, the Bering, um, the Bering Sea, and they're pushing for a deep port expansion to have that um, very narrow waterway become accessible to much bigger ships and become more busy, more, no just more, <clears throat> more pollution um, and the harm that that would cause to our animals. So I had um, drafted the letter and I had put in there um, my animal relatives and my dad was hesitant to say that. He said, you don't need to tell the whole world, but like share that piece of you that our animals are our relatives. Um, and that, it really struck with me because um, a quote, what, what he said to me was, of course I think of the animals as, as my relatives. I think of the, the seal as my cousin and the ogre as my brother. And 
it made me so emotional because he was so afraid to show that part of him to the world that it would be taken in a wrong way. Um, and I think that just the connection of the industrialization of our animals, of our food supply, how that you see how poorly our animals are treated and how we're just taken, they're just taken at meat value, at pound value, when they are so much more than that. And that's what my name means. I'm named after a little bear. Um, and that's something that I haven't even begun to understand or um, realize what that means to who I am. Um, and I hope to someday get there, um, but just really being able to understand the connection and really foster that relationship to our living, uh, other than human relatives. Yeah, they, the, the, the linkage is, is profound and intimate. Thank you. Thank you, Addie. Victoria. Yes. <laughs> um, I think this also speaks a little bit, uh, this is very wildlife related, but um, not only are the animals our ancestors, but of course um, we rely on them as a source for food. And I think that this is quite overlooked a lot, the fact that our relationship with wildlife is very much tied to our food security. And in that sense, uh, what I see as a big challenge for our communities is that often under under threat of climate change especially where we're putting in more effort um, because you know population popu wildlife populations are kind of changing where they want to be and uh, what times of the year they want to be there uh, just because of their preferred habitat of course and a lot of our species are migratory um, this can be very challenging for our food security and to me the those who will be most impacted by this food insecurity are our very young people, our small children, and also our elders. Um, we have some of the highest rates of food insecurity in the developing, the developed world. Um, we touched a little bit on this before, but uh, because of transportation issues, you know, my hometown has sea ice nine months a year. We don't even get ships. Uh, so all of our food, for the most part, in the modern sense, is coming from planes, and it's extremely expensive. It's sold by weight. Um, I'm always telling people that a gallon of milk where I come from is $11, but that doesn't mean very much to people in Europe. Um, but of course, like there have been there have been numerous uh, assessments of well-being in our communities that show that you know, children in my region, um, many 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 children in my region have gone more than 48 hours at some point in their life without eating. And this is, of course, um, something that is likely going to get worse in the future if we have less access to the hunting and fishing opportunities that we have always had. Um, but then, of course, you know, uh, our elders are, are very vulnerable to this as well because they rely very much on you know, their family and their community providing that, uh, that nutrition to them by gifting, usually. Um, we have a lot of... Uh, cultural practices around how much of the meat that you hunt needs to be given away. Um, and so our elders really rely also on this as a source of food because they also do not have necessarily the income, you know, the, 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 the measures of income are not, uh, they're not matching the requirements for living a sort of modern life in a, in a developed uh, country such as ours. Um, so this is also especially tricky. And these are the two that I worry the most about as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Brian, those affected and, and why? Absolutely. So when, it, when I think of the, the very straightforward impacts of climate change, what comes to mind are at the forefront those hunter-gatherers who rely on uh, re well, reliable ice formation patterns and 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 decent winters with lots of snow, lots of strong ice, not thin, weak ice, to uh, to traverse the land and uh, hunt and, and and trap. Like for example, both of my my grandfathers. Uh, when I, re I remember growing up, um, they were both very engrossed in. Uh, in, in trapping and, um, and, and, and a lot of hunting, and uh, they, they still are, but it's because now climate change is uh, 
like anecdotally, I've heard six to eight weeks uh, shorten winter seasons, which is a month and a half to, to two months. And when you only have, you know, like a quarter, you know, a third of the year, that's pretty significant. That's a pr pretty significant portion of uh, a, a very culturally relevant uh, period of, of the year being just eroded away. Um, uh, because now what's what's happening is uh, opportunities to go on the land in the winter to to go on snowmobile and go out and and just be on the the land are, they're, they're obviously impacted straightforwardly by the fact that there are there's less opportunity less time to, to do that less time to go out on a snowmobile which means there's less time to to engage in these very historically um, important uh, activities that um, are just so um, uh, big in, in Inuit culture. Um, and, and, and so, so that's what straightforwardly comes to mind, but there are, um, there's, a, there's a big piece as well, you know, of um, uh, then it becomes hard to actually propagate these traditions to, to the next generation, just because if it's hard for people to practice it individually, then it becomes hard to actually practice it as a community. Um, and, and that leads to, as, as my colleagues have, have uh, alluded to, issues of also food security when it becomes hard in the winter, especially to, 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 uh, to harvest uh, food off the land, then, uh, then it just leads to situations where people just have less opportunity to, to eat. Um, and, and as we saw in the video that uh, uh, at the beginning uh, of our colleague wasn't able to make it today, um, there's a lot of people who, who don't, they can't find economic opportunities in communities because, well, the capitalistic model doesn't work so well in the north where there, other than, say, mining, there isn't much money to be made because there isn't much money going around up there, right? Um, and and it's, it's really, really sad because then there becomes a correlative effect potentially wherein if uh, winters become less and opportunities to harvest relatively cheap natural um, uh, food off the land, um, if those opportunities become uh, less, then you have to necessarily turn to alternative sources such as store-bought meats and, and store-bought foods. And given the fact that there's already um, a lot of income inequality in Inuit communities, then it actually leads to uh, like d undesirable measures such as more mining expansion, more harming of the land. So it's a, uh, it's it's a pretty uh, dire, I, I guess, trajectory really, and uh, one that I hope, I, I personally hope, there is still time to change that trajectory. Yeah. Thank you each for underscoring uh, the compounding effects um, of, of not just climate change, but external influence, the, the writing of an op-ed to try to uh, 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 raise awareness, um, the, the fact that uh, in terms of our resources, the interference of government in management of our resources the, and, and its impacts on, on food security as well as all the other diverse interrelated elements. We started to kind of put one foot down the path of the next question, and that is if each of you could share your perspectives on the impacts of climate change on our on our on our mental health and well-being. You know, we Inuit are known to have put the human face on climate change. Well, a big part of it is is, is our mental well-being. Do you have any any of you any perspectives on that? Could, I could share a little bit. <clears throat> um, one of the things I've been burning to say, so oftentimes, you know, indigenous people were the face to climate change, but I also wanted to mention we're also the mind, the backbone, and the soul to the solutions to climate change and climate change action. Um, but in regard to our uh, mental health and the effects of climate change, we had just, um, ICC had just finished up facilitating a six-week Inuit Health Summit on our connection to culture and suicide prevention. Um, and as, um, as, as you, as, um, we, we, we experienced the highest, some of the highest suicide rates, the highest suicide rates of people across the world. 
Um, and so much of that is what um, Brian spoke to of how, how remote it is, how hard it is to live up there, how isolated we are, how um, the effects of um, the patriarchy, how colonialism and capitalism has forced these societal pressures to conform to so much of who we are, to be ashamed of who we are. So I just wanted to um, point that out and all the struggles that there are so many confounding factors and um, how to address those and um, our mental well-being is, is one very important aspect because we're losing so many future ancestors to suicide. So I just wanted to um, outline that just so everybody understands the, the importance of, of that. Thank you. Any other commentary, Victoria? Really fast, I just wanted to mention something that Brian actually had brought up recently, is the importance of being able to go out on the land, especially for um, young Inuit men. This is the population amongst our population that has um, some of the highest struggles with suicide, of course. There's a big identity crisis there, like what it means to be a man especially, I think is um, uh, very much impacted by sort of the colonial histories that we have been through. I myself have three brothers, so I do think about this quite a lot. Um, it's very important for young people to have opportunities to go out on the land and to feel like your life has a purpose in that way, um, that you are a provider, that you are somebody who can care for your community and for your family and for, you know, it's, it's not so much about self. I find that a lot of well-being is, is at the community level, like being able to have a relationship with all of our relations um, and, and to be able to pursue those kinds of um, activities has actually been shown to be very helpful in, in, in sort of our, our issues with well-being, uh, programs that encourage young men or you know even pay for young men to learn to hunt um, especially when, as we're trying to reclaim a lot of traditional practices, these have been very helpful in ensuring that uh, we can, I hate the word combat, that we can work with this issue um, and see if we can't improve it. Great. Brian? Yeah, so um, it's, it's just been so integral to any culture, you know, to be able to go on the land, to be able to, to harvest um, food in you know whether it's 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 animals or or um, berries and whatnot and, and, and other things um, so when there's there's a number of reasons why mental well-being would be detrimentally if impacted by the ever increasing packs of climate change I mean one of the biggest things if you're in a remote community and it's hard to get out say of that community with lots of financial barriers to overcome to even just visit elsewhere um, then it becomes really challenging to, to find m senses of control in one's life, senses of, of hope even, and um, it, it, it's very empowering, uh, empowering to actually be able to go out on the land and just um, be either with yourself or with friends, family, and, and just be kind of one with, with nature. I, I mean, something that's still something I am very privileged to be able to do even where I live now in St. John's, Canada, uh, where I uh, take my guitar and I'll go up by the ocean and, and just, uh, just kind of listen to the waves. And it's, it's, very, it's, it's, an, it's a different kind of being on the land, um, but it's one that uh, it's very integral to me and something that I, I grew, ha garnered a really a, a big appreciation for by growing up on the land as a youth, actually. And so uh, and I didn't have to worry about what's happening now contemporarily with uh, very unpredictable ice patterns, like they've become super unpredictable in recent years. Like I didn't have to worry about much of that when I was younger. This was like 20 years ago at this point. So the impacts were not as substantial as they are now. And um, and when, when you're, you're not able to be able to e explore and, and experience a, a really interesting sense of freedom, especially in the winter, when you can go out and travel wherever you want. The, the, the road is wherever your snowmobile can bring you then, not uh, not confined, constrained like paved roads are, say. Um, so when you lose that, uh, it becomes becomes very challenging. Yeah. So a concluding question. What are your hopes for COP26 as, as, as an individual in Nook and, and also uh, in terms of, of the Inuit throughout Inuit and Nanak? 
Yeah, I'll just, um, my hope is, um, I'm, 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 I'm always thinking like bigger picture, not so much. I'm always like, I'm working within my community. That's where I work, that's where I live. Um, but in, in terms of how systems work, I would really love to see, um, and I'm gonna use the analogy of a fern. So a fern, it has this very beautiful, there's leaves coming off every which way. And when you zoom in on one leaf, it looks the same as when it, you look at the whole fern. And it's fractal, and that's how, our, that's how our system should work. How things run at the community should translate to the regional, should translate to the international level. So I would love to see, um, we have this huge international organization that I'm still working to understand, but have, how that translates to the community, how it relates to the community, is how I would like to see um, our organizations make decisions, how they um, integrate themselves into every single level. So that's what I would like to see at the COP eventually, maybe sometime down the road. Thank you, Victoria. For me, I think that I'm really hoping that we can uh, focus on how each individual country can make their commitments because uh, as I speak about a lot, the sources of climate change are not uh, within our community. So we really rely on the commitments of other countries to curb their emissions. Um, this is fundamentally important, I think. Um, I had another thing. Ah, yes. I think that uh, continuing to have these discussions about how indigenous knowledge is applicable to climate change adaptation and recognition for its role in climate change adaptation uh, is going to be very important as we move forward as well. So I look forward to more discussions like that this COP, but also, of course, in preceding COPs, COPs after this. Yeah. Great. Brian. Yeah, so one thing that is, you know, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, is the fact that this is a problem that is not being generated by us, it's, but it's happening to us. So one of my biggest hopes is that there is uh, high top level accountability from, for example, governmental agencies uh, to, because what a lot of the emissions, of course, come from industrialization, uh, a lot of manufacturing, and these are all driven by capitalism. So, I mean, in effect, there is potential to draw the parallel here that climate change is another side effect, because there are many, of capitalism somewhat running unchecked in society. Um, so there, um, there are very straightforward measures that could be done to re reduce emissions to help course correct this trajectory we're on. Um, and uh, my biggest hope would be that bigger accountability would, would come from these agencies who can implement really positive, effectual change. Um, and, and one thing that, you know, is really like a message that I, I believe to be true is that tomorrow's prospects fundamentally depend upon today's preemption. And so more action needs to be done ASAP. Mm -hmm. Great, great, thank you. I um, am cognizant of the time, but I wonder if there's uh, a couple more minutes, or uh, okay, four minutes. All right, uh, we have um, a couple questions from the from the audience, and then we'll take those and then wrap up. I know that we I, I don't want to impose on the next uh, uh, gathering that's going to take place here. Please, if you'd like to pose a question, Martin, right behind you. The yeah, yeah, the, <laughs> the young man. Yes, he had his hand up. <laughs> and then you. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jacob, and I work with the Royal College of Psychiatry, which is sort of a professional body overlooking the psychiatric profession in the UK. Um, and I, I was wondering what your thoughts were about how helpful these concepts of, there's a concept called solastalgia, which is a description of distress and grief felt from a loss of land and habitation. So it's a technical word that's being offered by academia and it resonated a bit with what you were talking about in your one of your last questions. Um, so I guess part of my question is about how healthcare professionals can kind of interface with a lot of the experience that you've described about loss of land and how this has a distinct impact on, on mental health. Danny, if you want to respond to that. So, uh, I mean, um, just, just being 
I mean, as cool as a technical term, I had no idea. That's awesome. Uh, but just uh, just being cognizant of the, um, I mean, it's cultural awareness, really, right? Uh, being kind of woke, as it were, to the fact that for for Inuit, you know, the land is a big part of, of our culture, of our of our heritage, and so just to, to just have healthcare practitioners that are cognizant of that fact would be tremendously helpful, right? Because it, anything that can help to make a, a more equitable healthcare system, one that addresses issues that aren't, for example, affecting Western civilization, we'll say, uh, would that can only be beneficial. Yeah. Re neither one of you want to respond to that? Well, ne okay, next question, Martin. Yeah, that's right. First of all, thank you very, very much for your heartfelt account of the strength and the resilience and the solutions that lie with your worldview, your self-understanding and your understanding of nature. I feel it, so thank you. And so, um, but my question actually adds to your last question to, your, to the panel. How would you like to be empowered at this international spec scale as this COP? How would you like to be empowered to bring that voice forward? How can we and others support you? Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking about this and there's only one indigenous pavilion and I think we need more space, we need more celebration of who we are, we need to be given that, like, part of um, inclusion is making very intentional safe space. So like, like translate to our LGBTQ, two, like two-spirit plus relatives, you need to be very intentional about how you make that safe space. Not just anybody can do that. Indigenous people need to do that. LGBTQ, two-spirit plus people need to do that. So more space and then uh, pushing the undrift, like making that um, United, Na United Nations Declaration on Indigenous People um, felt at every level of organization. My, my, can I respond really fast to that? Okay. Yeah. My response also is that I know that the United Nations, like many international fora, really have their proceedings, like their, their protocols for how a meeting is supposed to go. And I think that this can be a little bit inflexible for our peoples because we do, we're, we're very much um, aware of our, our culture and where, where we need to place our gratitude and where we need to, like sort of the rituals behind that, like our practices behind that. And sometimes there is not space for that in a meeting or we are not used to these sort of sterile formats. Like we can do it because we, we have been trained to do that. But you know, to have, um, you know, everyday community members come to these kinds of events, like th these structures are very unusual to us. Um, and I think some flexibility within, within the UNFCCC, within uh, these kinds of meetings would be really beneficial. And I just want to add one thing. Uh, I mean, a very straightforward and easy thing would just be put us in front of the world leaders of, of the Arctic nations uh, just so we can share these same messages that we <laughs> share with you to them. Okay, we'll get that organized. <laughs> um, no, I just uh, want to appreciate the intellect of, uh, of these young people and uh, underscore again the, the significant contributions that, that not only them but uh, many others can make as far as the Inuit uh, to the issues of climate change. Just finally, a quick announcement. Um, on November 5th, tomorrow, uh, we will be hosting an Inuit day with numerous different uh, events, as well as on November 7th, a, a reception uh, to celebrate inter okay. the <laughs> night and day. Thank you, Joanna. This is, this is why we have a very capable uh, person uh, uh, assisting us. So uh, the, the main point is that um, International Inuit Day is November 7th, and it's to honor the, uh, the birthday of the founder of the Inuit Circumpolar Council. So we have events on November 5th and November 7th, and uh, please uh, look to the various different schedules for these events. We uh, welcome you to engage with us and um, continue with the, the dialogue and the conversation. Uh, we appreciate the space that we've been given here. Also, before we conclude, of course, Joanna McDonald has been uh, extremely helpful to us and uh, the, the, the segue to 
the pavilion and the numerous activities going on within within the COP, but also I want to draw attention to Lisa Kapekulak, who's the um, ICC Vice President for International Affairs in uh, Canada and an Executive Council member um, to the Inuit Circumpolar Council. And thank you all for your interest and your attention uh, today. So, kuyanat.